We're now live to the public. Awesome. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of the Universe Today. And this is your virtual star party for Sunday, January 19th, 2014. And it is going to be another good night tonight. Last week, we had the, uh, the Planetary Show. And this week, we, uh, the, and the week before, we had the Deep Sky Show, and this week we're going to blend it. We're going to have some planets, we're going to have some deep sky objects, it's going to be great. And we got a zillion telescopes. Oh, and the sun. So we'll get some daytime stuff, this is going to be great. All right, we're going to move through all the people that we have joining us today. So we've got Andrew Dumbleton from, uh, from the UK. Hey, Andrew, how's it going? Good morning. Well, good, yeah, good morning, yeah, good evening. <laughs> yeah. It's, what time is it there for you? Uh, just gone 2 o'clock. Is is uh, now I know you're going to do some deep sky stuff, but is uh, what what planets are up in the sky for you now? I've got Jupiter. I've got a wide field scope though, so I may have to reconfigure if I need to fall back on the planets. But also the Moon um, is just out the frontier. Yep. Right on. All right, we got Dave Dickinson. Hey, hey. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. How, your, how do your skies look? It's it's clear here. It's a little turbulent, but it's about as clear as it gets. So it's like yeah, it's like I figured I would join in with uh, Jupiter, and I might have the moon rising about halfway through. Uh, I I may try to get that wide field coming over the trees. Okay, great. We got Gary Ganell. Hey, Gary. Hi guys. And uh, you're good here. Your yeah. Los Angeles is on fire, right? Yeah, that yeah, is. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Again, it's the time of the year when. No, actually, it's not the time of the year. No, I guess that normally happens. When they, uh, early. usually send all the temporary guys home. Um, and we've got terrifying James McGee. Hey, James. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there we go. Whoa. <laughs> Be afraid. Be very afraid. <laughs> where, where are you located, James? Huntsville, Alabama. Right on. Okay. And we get John Kramer, did you, who is who can't find himself, so he's just going to be our virtual friend tonight. No, that that's me. I just I just look like an edge on uh, Spiral Galaxy. <laughs> you look an edge on Spiral Galaxy. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, you're just having one of those evenings. I'm just having one of those evenings. You got it. <laughs> we got Shaw Ahmad from uh, from Malaysia. Hey, Shaw. Hi. Hi. So now, if people have missed it, Shaw released his uh, sort of his masterpiece, which is this wonderful uh, time lapse animation of. Venus moving towards the inferior conjunction, then out the other side, and just it's just terrific. So if you haven't already, follow him on uh, Twitter, it's Shaw Gazer, and yep. uh, and you can see that the animation. I've retweeted it, but uh, and we're, we're we might be working on an article about this for Universe today. I can't, uh, you know, <laughs> I can't say that I have assigned David Dickinson the story. <laughs> David it's pretty, Dickinson. It's pretty, it's, it's yeah, pretty yeah, amazing, yeah. amazing that he that he managed to track it right through interior conjunction. This was an ideal time to do it too. So. Yeah, 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 no, no. I think it's 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 a I think it's a it's a masterpiece. So I, I can't wait to sort of show that show everyone that. So yeah. we got Tom Nathan. Hey Tom. Hi. And yeah. no telescope, but you are going to bring some additional knowledge. I'll bring my wit and charm <laughs> and No, 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 just just knowledge. No just no. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I can't be witty, can't be charming. Uh, All well, right, just smart. <laughs> that's, that's my job. No. Okay. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Now Scott uh, is in the middle of a move, so he wasn't able to join us tonight, and uh, other people are sick, and other people have broken telescopes, and other people have rain. So so but I think this is great. We've got a really good crowd tonight. So let's uh, well let's get rolling. Uh, so first, I'm gonna start with Andrew. And uh, oh, where where'd your Orion go? I'll bring it back. It, I've there lost it in the tr I've lost it in the trees, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> was just appearing when I took that snapshot, but uh, yeah, I took a snapshot just before it went. Oh, is that the tree over on the left there? It is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh, but it's great. So, so what's interesting is that you're using a different kind of camera than a lot of people are using. You're using what's called a Malin cam. That's right. Yes. Yes. An Astro video camera. So this and is a, a, a near real-time live view. I think when I took this one, it was uh, about 20 seconds. Wow, 20 seconds. Yeah, and then if it goes much yeah. larger, longer than that, it'll just over-brighten, right? It will, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Look at that. So it's great. Orion's back. How cool is this? Uh, yes, it's one it of is. our favorite objects. And so Gary's got Orion happening too, right? Yep. 
Yep, that's it there. This is still a work in progress trying to uh, get the color, but I'm getting it. Well, uh, what's important for people to understand, right, is that for the last two years, literally, you've been doing black and white, you've been doing monochrome images in hydrogen alpha, and and now we're switching and you're testing out methods of actually bringing color into the virtual star party, and it's, it's kind of hard, and uh, you're having to modify your technique, so... It, it's much more difficult, but this one is showing hydrogen alpha as the red, um, so it's not the Hubble palette, but I like the red better than uh, making the hydrogen green. And then the um, the green in this picture is any sulfur. Uh, you can see a little bit of it where it's turning a greenish in here. And then the blue is oxygen. Oh, and one thing just to remind people is we're using the Q&A app in uh, Hangout. So if yeah. you're watching this on YouTube somewhere, you can see... Uh, it says that Fraser Kane is currently answering questions, and if you click on that, you'll see... Uh, oh, I think I may have to mute Tom here. Um, yeah, so you can see that we're answering questions, and if you go into the Q&A app, you can post your question there, and, and we'll try and answer it as we as we go. So if you have any questions about objects you want to see, or even questions about the setup, the gear, if you want to know anything about uh, just interesting questions about space and astronomy, you know, by all means, that's a place to, to go. Um... All right, I'm going to move to uh, to Shaw's view because it's coming and going. Yeah. In the sun. What, what is this b big burning ball of fire you've got here, Shaw? <laughs> it's the sun at the moment, and it's not burning up. Actually, so those are clouds uh, passing by at the right moment of the virtual star party. So, I don't know. Somebody's buying a new telescope or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, no so whoever fault. just bought it. Yeah, so one of our viewers, <laughs> whoever just bought themselves a new telescope, if you could please fess up, that would be great. The, the, <laughs> the number of cloudy days is directly proportional to the size of the aperture in inches, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, is it, is it cumulative, though? You know, because you have to remember all those Christmas telescopes. Yeah, that's Do all those yeah. apertures add up? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. right. All those terrible <laughs> Christmas telescopes that get handed out this year. Um, oh, that's good. All right, I'm going to move to David's view here because because yeah, it's, it's, it's a little turbulent, but I've got Jupiter up there. We don't have any moon or shadow transits uh, this week, unfortunately. You know, I, I looked ahead uh, and did some simulations. On February 9th, we should have a, a shadow transit of Europa during the virtual star party. So that Ooh, that would really be the kind of if we're, if we're still doing it at 9 o'clock at that point. If we start moving the... the I know in the springtime we start moving the times further back. So that, that So when does it start? Uh, it starts at the beginning of the show and we'll probably have it the at the very... The shadow transit actually starts before the show, but the very first 15 minutes of the show we'll have uh, Europa still casting a shadow back on Jupiter. And that's in... Uh, February that's in, like, 9th. It's cool. Yeah. That's three, three Sundays from yeah, now. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's give it a try. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. The moon configuration I saw tonight, I think uh, Io's off to one side, and the other three Galilean moons are on the other side. And there's a seventh magnitude star that's an imposter tonight, too, that looks like a fifth Galilean moon. I saw that in your preview. You had, you yeah. had a preview in showing I was look, the... Yeah, I was looking at it with the eyepiece, and I'm like, oh, there's a fifth moon tonight. So it's like, uh, I looked it up. It's actually a star. And again, we do, we didn't get a great red spot, right? Nope. Still, it, it just went around the limb according to Sky and Telescope. I, I looked that up. So, <laughs> any idea when we'll get one of those? Because shouldn't I'll it have... be like half the planet? How is it I'll... that we're not seeing it, even though you know? It, well, Ju Jupiter rotates every nine hours. It's it's really fast, so it's uh, it, it it's just rotated out of view. It, it can rotate through one full rotation in one night. Right now, when you're at opposition, if you watch it all night. I think you know what we're just gonna wait. I've heard some. <laughs> I've heard some rumblings. I see Bob King writing an article. I don't know if it's out yet about Jupiter's red spot maybe shrinking. That's the first I've heard of that. But uh, apparently uh, there may be some uh, some changes going on with the red spot right now. Wow! Can you imagine yeah. if the red spot went away in our lifetime? <laughs> well, we lose a northern equatorial belt uh, about every decade or so. A few years ago, you see how <laughs> Jupiter's got two stripes on it right now. A few years ago, it only had one stripe. And there's a lot of discussion. I believe it's the northern belt, not the southern, that uh, every decade or so it fades out for a while and then it comes back. Now, is that done with uh, just the, the, the local and organic chemicals within the bands of Jupiter, do you know? Or is I'm, that a uh, storm sure. condition? 
I'm pretty sure. I, I know what I've always wondered is why is that one belt kind of uh, fading in and out and the other one's pretty yeah. stable. I've never heard. Uh, I know a few years ago when I wrote about it when that belt faded out, they imaged with, I think it was Hubble, uh, looked at it uh, in the near-infrared, and you could still, it was there, it was just hiding. It was kind of like submerged a little bit, the yeah. cloud top. So it just seems hmm. to sink down occasionally for some reason. Well, I'm gonna it move to uh, I'm gonna move to John's view here, and uh, and so he can he can stop being the galaxy and be something else, probably some other galaxy. Um, but yeah, what are you looking at, John? I was gonna try some different galaxies. This is a uh, this is NGC uh, 891. It's a spiral galaxy in the constellation Andromeda. And, and I think uh, what's great about this is, I mean, we're seeing it edge on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you really get to see the the dust right there in the middle there exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you see that dust lane on the side, and then you can see the bulge, the the central galactic bulge. So so the Milky Way is about a hundred thousand light years across, but the but the actual thickness of the Milky Way is only about a thousand light years thick. Although it does bulge out a bit more at the sort of at the central core, and so you can really see that that structure. Um, got a question here. Uh, Scott Chapman asks, granted I'm a beginner, but Registax is killing me. Maybe there are better alternatives for a novice. Any chance for a basic photo stacking tutorial one of these nights? Didn't didn't uh, didn't the team do one uh, last year? I you know, I, I re recall something like that. Um, yeah. yeah, like uh, Stewart and Mike Phillips yeah. and uh, and a bunch of them. Paul Stewart, I think, all got together and did a Registax tutorial and they, they took a couple of nights and did it all live and showed it. So do do a search for Stuart Foreman and Registax and I you know and Astro Imaging. And I know he did it and uh, Chris did it. And I think they did this all about a year ago. So I think they're you know the team has done one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, essentially you... Okay. Go ahead. No, uh, I was gonna say yes. I, you know, just the thirty-second dim th uh, th thumbnail sketch on it. You just take, you know, if, I don't know if you're doing video or uh, f uh, imaging, but just take as if you're doing video, take as many uh, video seconds of video as you possibly can, and just cherry pick out the the good frames and and stack it from there. Um, uh, that that's what I do, and I'm no expert at it. And I gotta and, say, uh, I I know about maybe a tenth of what Registax does. I I know what yeah. I, I need it to do, but there's there's so much in it. It's cool. Oh. It's a free program, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the masters are Mike Phillips. I'd say Mike I, Phillips is the master for I, sure. I I know when when you do wavelet processing in it, that's where the images really snap too. I see that I see mm -hmm. the biggest difference. On uh, just playing around with the wavelet pro processing it seems to be a huge help. You know, there there's another alternative out there too. I I've used Auto Stacker too. Oh, oh yeah. Auto Stacker too. Uh, that that's a pretty nice little program. You know, you you do all the aligning and everything else with that program. You then once it creates the image, you bring it in, into your Registax, but all you have to do is adjust your wavelets at that point, and it really sharpens up. It, it's a nice little oh. quick program. What do you use, Shaw? Yeah, I use the Auto Stacker too. It's much much easier compared to Registax. It's much, it's only three steps that you have to do. Step mm -hmm. one, two, and three. So much cool. easier. And I, I did the same thing. I once I stack everything, I put into the Registax for the wavelet uh, adjustment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. So there's a there's a bunch of votes for auto it's so it's called Auto Stacker 2. Is there a price for the software? It's a free. It's free. free. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah, I love great. that. Yeah, yeah. So give that a try and then maybe talk to us next week and let us know how, how that goes. Um and so we're back to the sun and the, the clouds have moved. So look at these uh look at these sunspots. So you can see on these sunspots on the sun. Uh, I don't know if you have a whole image of the sun somewhere, but um, but the sunspots they have these two different colors on the surface. You can see there's the the kind of the darker central part of the sunspot, and then this part around. And so the and I always forget which one is which. The umbra and the penumbra. <coughs> I always forget which dark. one is which. The umbra, umbra is dark. Yeah. So the yeah. so the middle part is the umbra, and then that kind of lighter colored block just, around it is called the penumbra. Just like during a lunar eclipse, you call the same thing the shadow of the of the Earth is the umbra is the dark center, and penumbra yeah. is the outer. Outer cone. 
Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so what these are, right, is these are these places where the sun's twisted magnetic field is actually piercing the surface of the sun, and they come in pairs because they're these magnetic loops on the surface of the sun. And then these loops will, tis, will twist and, and coil, and eventually they snap and reconfigure on the surface of the sun, and so then you'll get sunspots appearing in, d in different locations. And although they look dark, they're still incredibly hot. They just happen to be a little cooler than the the rest of the surface of the sun, and so they appear dark in comparison of the of the rest of the sun. Uh, a major mystery is that we're supposed to be at solar maximum right now, but there's if you look at the sun, there's only a few tiny. We had a big sunspot um, active region 1944 a few weeks ago that rotated out of view. But the the sun is uh, this solar maximum has been kind of lackluster. Yeah, yeah. From yeah, from what I read, it's something like the weakest solar maximum in over the last yeah. 150 years or something like that. Yeah, and we and thought it was going to be the big one. Like we yeah. thought this was yeah. going to be the big solar well, max. There's the the story maybe that the next cycle 25. They wonder if it's going to the the cycle might not even happen because it seems like it's diminishing every cycle right now. Wow, take what do you think about that uh, <laughs> Tuesday, folks? <laughs> I'm gonna move to Gary's view here because I think uh, I think it looks just great. Look at this. This is Horsehead in the Frame Nebula or the Flame. Nice. I I can definitely see it. Look at the horsehead and the colors. Oh yeah, yeah, this is terrific. Yeah, the horsehead for me is so hard to. I'm I'm in a deep suburban area, and, and capturing the horse head has always been a challenge for me. I can get everything else but that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I couldn't do it without the narrow man filters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think people need to understand, right, is that you have, when you say you have the narrow band filters, you've got these three filters, one for hydrogen alpha, one for sulfur, one for oxygen, and they are having one little snippet of the of the spectrum of light that is not polluted by by the light by the light pollution in your city. So, right, it's rejecting everything else. Uh, Helen Reed says, "How big are those two largest sunspots that we're looking at? What do you what do you think the size, David or Shaw?" Hmm, I think it's about the the last big one, 1944, was what four times big as the Earth. This is yeah. much smaller. I think it's about something the same like size. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so Earth size. Yeah. 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 yeah 1944 can, you know. may 1944 may survive and come back around again in a week or two. Yeah. So you're not talking about the date. You're talking about the the number of the uh, of yeah, the sunspot. They, they they started numbering. Uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration started numbering sunspots in 1972, I think. And so we're just counting up sunspot active region groups from there. From so uh, would this be one group that we're looking at right now? I think those are two separate ones. And chances are we're getting those magnetic field lines coiling from one of those spots to the other one, right? It could be, yeah. yeah. It's hard to tell if those are two related ones or if those are, are two. And they, they flip polarity with the... Uh, that's how they can tell when the solar cycle's starting, too, when they get the new solar cycle. They, the sunspot groups actually flip yeah. polarity, too. So. so I've got another question here. This comes from uh, Christy Parsons. I have a 130-millimeter telescope but I can't see detail images like these. What size would I need in order to see details like the great, like the big red spot on Jupiter? Uh, 130 millimeter. Is it? I have to tell us whether that's a refractor or a reflector because 130 millimeter refractors. That's a big refractor. That's a big refractor. Yeah. 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 You'd be getting views as at pretty much like some of the stuff you're seeing here. If it's a reflector, I'm trying to think what that is. That's. Uh, thirteen centimeter. Uh, That's pretty big. Well, yeah. Like five point one, isn't it? Five. Yeah. So it's a five. five inch, that would be yeah. a five inch telescope, which is you know sort of on the smaller end of, of of telescopes. You should be able to see the Great Red Spot, and especially, I mean, the magic of this hobby is is using a camera. Like like once you hook up a camera to your telescope and you record the video, and you. Uh, and you turn that into a hey Mike Simmons is here. Oh, I should bring Mike Simmons in. I'm gonna summon him. Hold on, Mike. You're you're getting summoned. I didn't realize you were you were watching. Um uh hold on. Okay. Now I'm uh, distracted. 
Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So I mean, once you go down that that rabbit hole, and once you actually have the the tel the camera attached to your telescope, and you're taking these videos, and that's where this registrax issues come from. That's that's when you really get uh, you can see the real detail. And so a lot of the pictures that we're showing, these are live video, but some of the really nice pictures that you see on you know on the web and stuff, those were done because the person just captured a ton of video and then stacked it all on their you know on their on their computer. And with the, even with a five inch telescope, you could absolutely see the red spot. The, the best time to observe Jupiter right now that it just passed opposition is right toward local midnight when it's you want to get it when it's absolutely highest in the sky for your location because yeah. you're going to be looking through the thinnest part of the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, okay, so Mike Simmons, who I hope he's got my invite, uh, said that a uh, low, almost non-existent solar cycle was predicted by Penn and Livingston at NSO based on historical data. Not sure if it was published, but I saw the manuscript. So, uh, so well, so then, uh, from what, you know, what we had all heard was that there was going to be a, you know, it was going to be a big cycle this year, this time around, but, uh, in fact, we were writing this would be the big one. And so it's so it's great that some people were, were Anticipating I, I, to not be the best. I've read I've read some papers on why that might be and what's going on with the sun. And there's they're 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 thinking there may be larger cycles in addition to the eleven year cycle, like the you remember the Maunder minimum that happened in the seventeenth century where they had the the Thames River froze and things like that. So we, yeah. we may be in in one of those different uh, cycles right now where the sun is just being less active. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, but you should, you know, with a, even with a five-inch five telescope, you can definitely see, definitely see the bands, definitely see the moons, and on a nice night, you should be able to see the red spot if you know when it's coming by. Yeah. Um, John, what have you got here? This is Messier 82. M82, which is a galaxy uh, also commonly called the Cigar Galaxy in Ursa Major. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. you can see uh, the dust, different distribution, I guess you call it, of dust in this particular galaxy. Mm -hmm. One of the classic pictures, there's one that's taken by Hubble uh, that shows just this amazing, like shows the cigar-shaped galaxy, but then also this crazy sort of uh, filament structure that's coming off from the center of the galaxy as well. Something happened on this galaxy. Yeah, that's an what's called an active galaxy. If I remember my my astronomy lessons, uh, it's uh, it's got it has a, a huge a lot of a lot of dust in it. Also, it has a very active star forming region in, in it, um, and I don't think it's a producer of supernovae. At least not yet, anyway. But it's it does put out a lot of radio energy. You know, it's it's really, really prominent in, in the radio frequencies as opposed to optical. That's why I need to have uh, Nicole Gallucci here to, to explain <laughs> that better. <laughs> um, Alright, let's move on over. I'm going to see what Gary's got. This is Andromeda. Andromeda. And Mike, uh, I just sent you an, in, uh, a link that you bring into the Hangout. One thing I was noticing is you can pick out the uh, nebulosity regions that show up in red. You can see them all around the outside. Like as we see the Orion Nebula, those are the nebulas for the uh, for the people in that galaxy. Excellent. Oh, very cool. Yeah, you don't get to see it good. very often with the mm, mm. But with the hydrogen alpha filter, it's accentuating that, so you can see them all around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I always like showing people the Andromeda galaxy. Everybody likes looking at the core, and uh, I'll I'll take the telescope and I'll I'll take it several degrees off away from the core. And then they start seeing the dust lanes visually, and I say, you know, okay, here this is still the Andromeda galaxy. You know, the core is way over one side. You're looking at way over on the other side, and it's still part of the galaxy. I've, I've had several people just get flabbergasted that they can see the dust lanes visually. There we go. There's Mike Simmons from Astronomers Without Borders. Hey, Mike. I think there's some background noise going on there, but 
I think you're listening to this show. I think yeah, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I didn't know how to join with that. I'm sorry to be a Google Luddite, but <laughs> no problem. Um, awesome. Okay, well, let's. Uh, where do I want to go now? Andrew, what I've have got you got there? It looks like you're something artificial. Uh, is that actually Jupiter? And uh, I've just over oh, the moon for the moon. Oh, oh yeah. Huh. Oh, that's great. Okay, so David, what are they? Which ones are they? I I've got. Uh, well, let me look at Andrew's view here because it's just a little different than mine. I've got. Uh, there's three on one side, and I believe it's Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto's got to be that further one out. And Io's on the other side right now. And I was going to be going in behind Jupiter into shadow right after the show, so but it's it's kind of cool that you can actually see Europa, and, and they're all stacked three on one side. And there's like I said, there's a seventh magnitude star. It doesn't show up in my field right now, but it, I I can't quite go that deep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and here's James' view. Oh yeah, there it is. Look at that. Yeah, sorry guys, I had to uh, switch cameras. My webcam driver actually died, so I had to go inside and get my DSLR. I oh. think it it was a good call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even my regular webcam uh, that shows my face didn't work. I was like, ah, what's going on? But uh, I <laughs> oh, finally got everything working. I think you freaked it out. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right well, where's that coming from? Sorry. <laughs> my, this is what happens when I join in the middle of something. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's okay. We, you know, we're a lot more casual on the virtual star party than we are in the uh, weekly space hangout. Area, you know, um, I'm gonna go back to the sun. That Jupiter is gorgeous, though. Look at that. Oh yeah, that is something. Now, can you click that little button at the bottom right-hand corner one there? James? Oh, there we go. Is that what it did? Hmm. No, I didn't like I'm that. I'm sorry, uh, what, what were you saying? The, the bottom right-hand corner, there's like a little like full-screen thing there. Yeah, I don't think that actually does that. I think it just goes back to my... Uh, yeah, it doesn't yeah, do it. Yeah, it pulls back up my, uh, my no. full view. That's no, all no. it does. I was hoping it would give like a full-screen thing. but. Yeah, I experimented for a very long time trying to get it to, to do that, and sadly that doesn't work. Um, so Mark uh, Redwell says that if we hit low next time, we could get a mini ice age. So that's interesting. Yeah, that's, what, that's uh, what you're talking about, David. In Fraser, there uh, actually the the paper I was referring to there, and some of the historical things indicated, you know, they were predicting a very low uh, solar minimum, even a, like a Maunder minimum coming up. So uh, there there was some indication of that, but. So we can go well ice skating out. on the Thames yeah. in yeah, the summer? Yeah, like have, have the frost fairs on the river because the, Thames, yeah, the, the Thames froze during the last Maunder minimum. Usually it doesn't, uh, doesn't freeze. And they had several others without summers in that, in that period, too. Uh, Eamon Equalist asked, is Jupiter an unlit star? I am glad you asked that question. I just That's recorded a, a video question. on that. And the, the gist is, uh, no, you would have to crash 80 more Jupiters into Jupiter to get, uh, to get a star. So it's, it's an unlit star in that if you get 79 more Jupiters you, and crash them together, you will then get a star. Well, keep in mind, in 2061, the aliens turned it into a star. Did they crash oh, 79 right. more Jupiters into it? I don't know how they did it. They didn't yeah. say. No, yeah. they, did, they just... The monoliths took care of that, I think. Yeah, collapsed right. it into a singularity. Yeah, yeah. Or no, yeah. into a star. They got it. To anyway, that's the only way that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> only in the movies. Only in the movies. Yeah, just with a, like an awful lot of Jupiters crashed into it. It's the same thing. Like, how can we get? Uh, uh, how can we get uh, the sun to uh, explode as a supernova? Right? You just crash. I don't know. Eight more suns into it. And you'll, yeah. You'll get, you, Get your supernova. Yeah, the ones I um, like is you know, adding adding more water to the sun to see if they can extinguish it. <laughs> <laughs> it's already half water. Yeah. 
<laughs> it just it just adds more hydrogen. Yes, yeah, it just it just adds some oxygen. You get water. Yeah. I wonder if you did right. If you poured an equivalent amount of oxygen into the sun, oh would it just God. turn into a big blob of water? <laughs> <laughs> Then, then you throw in a tea bag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, John, what do we got here? What do we got? This is uh, M81, pretty close there to M82, but this is more of I uh, I don't think it's completely a face-on spiral galaxy. Somebody else might know that, but yeah. uh, Real close. it is. Yeah, it's very close. Yeah. 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 But it's a you've got a really tight field of view. I mean, you're. I mean, are you cropping your images pretty tight, or you've got a, you know, what's your what's your focal length on this one? This is 8-inch uh, Schmidt, so it's 8-inch uh, uh, Schmidt, but it's not operating at the native F10. It's uh, actually at F3.3 with a reducer. So that's actually about the widest field of view that I could get with it. <laughs> and wow. it's very narrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's what like a planetary galaxies? setup, right? Yeah, for planetaries, for galaxies, you know, just not wide field. Yeah, exactly. Oh, very interesting. Um, and Mark Redwell notes that the UK had no summers for five years during the last minimum. And then, of course, that's going to make our job even tougher, explaining global warming. Well, and and I, I wonder, uh, it seems to me when I go to the UK, they don't really ever have summer now anyway, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> The coldest, uh, what is it, the coldest uh, winter I ever spent was summer in San Francisco? Yeah, they oh yeah. For London too, right? So could, that was actually a concern, the, the solar physicist who sent me uh, Bill Livingston and Matt uh, Penn's uh, manuscript said was that this could mask the effect of global warming if we went into something like a Maunder minimum and uh, then we came out of it it would be really bad. Oh, because it would be like a, um, it would just be like extra cold and it would balance out and then when we came out of the minimum we would have this spike in temperature. Yeah, that would be yeah. very bad. All right. um, what else we got here? Uh, Earlier your phrase about the great red spot. and You know, I could see it very easily in my first telescope of four and a half inch um, 40 years ago. And uh, in anything since. So when it's good, it's it's easy in small scopes. People should check it out in anything that they yeah. have available under good conditions, uh, except for several years there when it kind of disappeared for a while. Took a break. Andrew's got the moon. I've got the uh, little known black spot on Jupiter right now. <laughs> Is that the dust? <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, hey, look at what Gary's found. Gary, what the rosette? Perhaps, what is this? The Rosette Nebula. Right on. Now, even wow. better in color. One of the problems with this is since I'm taking three separate pictures and not guiding, if you look carefully at the stars, especially up here, yeah. you can see they're offset. It moved a little bit between the two frames. This is one second per. So it's a, or excuse me, one minute, one minute. So it's a three minute a, total. The satellite on the green image. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. The satellite over on the right hand side. Yeah, yeah, that's passing through. <laughs> that's really probably good. an airplane. I don't think that's a satellite because it's yeah, um, it's tumbling if it is. Blinking. Yeah. That's great. Interesting. Uh, oh, Mark Redwell says, we do have summers, just the rain is warm. Yeah. And that's, that's here that in sounds, Oregon. That's, yeah, that sounds, like, that sounds like where I live, too, on the west coast of Canada. Yeah. Our, our winters are cold and rainy, and our summers are warm and rainy. Um, oh, David, what have you got? What's David's view? What do we got here? Oh, we lost him. Oh, I'm back on. I was just muted because I was cleaning off the scope. I'm, uh, I was wondering what that oh, was. I'm, that, that is the moon. That is the moon behind the trees right now. Okay, yeah, yeah, the moon I'm, rising. I'm, I'm reconfiguring the camera so I can get. All right, the, I'll, I'll wait till you're moon back. in there. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm oh. gonna go to Andrew's view because that moon is terrific. Look at that. Yeah, that's great. Didn't realize my field of view was that wide. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. That that is like a just a nice perfect moon. This is this is what we will be seeing in a couple of hours as the moon rises, because you're living in the future. That's right. <laughs> Eight hours into my future. 
<laughs> oh, that's great. And uh, and can you tell that it was a mini moon? Oh well, yeah, I was nice able to more. get it in his field of view. It's it's in Smallland. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. How, so if it wasn't, you know, if it was a super moon, it would be more, you know, having trouble fitting in this view. Exactly. I like the ray patterns on the bigger craters there. You know, Copernicus, Tycho. Uh, I can't remember the other two over there, but that's that that's really good about showing how uh, asteroids as they impact the moon. How they kick up a debris, debris field, and, and uh, actually cr the the rays themselves are secondary and tertiary craters uh, from the initial impact debris. Well, I'm less less used to this view of the moon because it's yeah you know, we, we see it sort of in the early evening a lot of the time as it's approaching full moon, but now it's gone past full moon and it's starting to wane again, and so you don't see it from this perspective very often unless you're up at you know. In the early morning after it's gone after it's gone to a full moon. <laughs> or if you're over in UK with the uh, be in the future. Well, exactly. All right, you know, yeah. we have someone. <laughs> One of the common questions we often get from people is about the phase of the moon and if you see the same thing in different parts of the Earth. And you have a good opportunity here to show people it's the same phase no matter where you are on the planet, as long as you can Absolutely. see. Absolutely. Yeah. And unless you're. Northern and southern hemisphere, then the, then the moon flips upside down for you. <laughs> um, Convenient of it to do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna move. Boy, I'm gonna go back to the sun for a bit. Although Shaw is battling clouds. Yeah. <laughs> it's also pretty thick at the moment. I couldn't get Venus in the view just now. So. Oh, you tried for oh. Venus. Yeah, I tried for Venus just now. Oh well. well you yeah, you yeah. must have some serious overcast there, Shaw, for. Those, that type of clouds. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> pushing up the game quite a lot here, but yeah, he's plagued by clouds at all times. <laughs> they they haunt him and chase him around. <laughs> you have my sympathy. Uh, li li living in the West Coast here in in North America, I'm used to the clouds. Uh, I'm gonna move to James View. Well, let's go back to Jupiter for a bit. Although David, you're like doing an art project here now. <laughs> I know. So for some reason, my camera keeps wanting to freeze up. I'm trying to like get it unstuck. <laughs> you sure I won't see the red spot? You've 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 done the math, right, David? Uh, you know, uh, sometimes the the tables I use are in Sky and Telescope, but sometimes they are off by an hour or two. It does drift around a little bit in longitude, so you know it is possible. Because I would I could tell like it looks like it's appearing on the. Yeah, on the Diff top there. Di but different different predicting tables will will be off by a little bit because it does drift around a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think you might be right there, Freeze. You got something popping up the, the, yeah. with a limb darkening. Okay. It's kind of hard to tell. Yeah. So okay. So I moved to John's view. John, what what is this? Some planetary nebula? This is yeah. I have never seen this one myself either. I just decided I was going to try to nab it. It's NGC 1501, a planetary nebula in Camelopardus. If I've said that correctly. As this is a little bit zoomed in now. I I didn't. Uh, I uh, let me. Well, that's very zoomed in. But here's the field of view that I have, and you can make it out pretty clear right here. And then what is this NGC 1501? 1501. Yep. I've I've never seen this before. It's this got a, a magnitude uh, 14.5 central star. Wow. Hey, not bad. Yeah, no, I've never seen this before. I've, like I'm seeing some pictures on the internet, but uh, but I've never seen this guy observe. It's beautiful. Note the uh, the blotches in inside there. It's not artifact. I've I've seen this one in big telescopes many times and. That's a uh, real detail that you're seeing the uh, inconsistencies in the planetary nebula. Yeah. Well, that's that's almost like the the bubble nebula, but with a, a brighter star in the center. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's pretty small, bright. It's high surface brightness. Yeah. Wow. Nicely done. Wow. Like like Very you put good. everything on the uh, on the menu now. This is good. Well, how about that supernova in uh, Ursa Major? 
I believe a gauntlet I, I, was just I, thrown I down. Is that one? Where is that one? What do I have first one oh, here? Oh, that. We just did M one. It's in, wasn't there one in M one hundred one a few years ago? Yeah, there was one yeah, in M one hundred one. There is. Uh, hold on a sec here. Let me look it is up real one, quick. Is there one currently? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, it is. Oops, that was from two thousand eleven. Sorry about that. Um. It is in First Major, no, that's 1993. Ah, I'm not finding it. Google Foo is <laughs> failing me. Oh, well. Six live telescopes right now. That's not bad. This is very yeah. good. The Moon, the Sun, Jupiter, Deep Sky Objects, and David's Art Project. Let's go to David's art project. <laughs> yeah, that is the moon behind the trees. You can kind of yeah. see the trees there. It's, it's, uh, it hasn't quite cleared the tops of the trees. What are you What are you trying to say, David? Is this something about uh, man's uh, insensitivity <laughs> towards nature or nature's it, it, na brightness? Nature's in insensitivity toward telescopes. Toward telescopes, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Could you cut down that tree? Uh, it's 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 over on a conservation area. I don't think they right. don't like that too much. All right. It looks kind of cool once it gets to the tops of the trees. Oh, and just zooming in here. Check this out. That is a that is a nice view. That's a wonderful camera. I'm still you know with the Malin cams. I'm still still trying to wrap my head around them because they operate in a funny way. Like not the CCDs. They have this the way they work as, as a live video camera. So trying to figure out how best to, to integrate them into the star party. But boy, you know, getting the moon in this like like this is great. Okay. The uh, supernova, that is in NGC 7331. It's not too far off from uh, Beta Ursa Major. So interesting. How, how bright is it, do you know? One more time. Seven thirty seven three three one is the galaxy. Seven three three one, yes. Is okay. the galaxy. Uh magnitude and um, this one here from this is from the IAU, it's uh fifteen point five. That's yeah, still you know, it's mm. bright for an it's, extragalactic one, but it's, yeah. it still would be tough for, for a backyard scope. Yeah. I don't see anything about distance. Okay, we'll give it a try, if that's yeah. what you want to yeah. do. Or try another try. deep sky object. So I'll move to Gary's sure. view now. This is our old buddy, the Propeller Nebula. Looks great, especially in color. Yeah, this one came out real nice, and it's mostly hydrogen, so we're mostly going to see red. That's uh, one minute per filter. Wow. <clears throat> and the scope stayed aligned for each one, so we don't have uh, chromatic stars. Well, it looks like you almost got... Uh, some dust in the background there too. It looks uh, along with the red. It's looking really, really dark there at the bottom. Yeah, well, I've still got a little bit of a problem. With flats from left to right. Oh, uh, okay. The right side's a little lighter than the left. Yeah, I can see some. Was that amp glow in the lower right corner? Uh, I think so. I, I think yeah. it's again my flat doesn't compensate for it. Quite yeah. Enough. But still, that's great. Yeah, it's one minute. That's, you know, three-minute total that's... exposure. But its color is so much harder than <laughs> monochrome. Yeah. I, I have a S big ST8 uh, monochrome camera, but I have a filter wheel on it. And unfortunately, my filters are not... Um, all the focusing is different for each of the filters, so it's really, really tough getting all the f filters together and then making a decent uh, composite picture that way because inevitably something comes out out of focus. Yeah, and that's um, my filters focus a little different also. Yeah. But um, I'm using Maxim DL and uh, mm -hmm. I found out that there's a way that I can tell it to refocus as it goes to each filter and how much uh, offset. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if I'm, well, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I, I don't have the uh, uh, autofocus 
mechanism on my my stuff, so I have to do everything by hand. Yeah, uh, so I got a question here from it. Vance McCauley. Uh, hey guys, I'm taking images of M42 and keep getting faint short streaks. Am I correct to assume that these are geosynchronous satellites? Yeah, right around M42, you, you do have some geosats right there that you get images quite frequently. But I'm just I'm just thinking, right? So geosynchronous, so they're going to stay at the same spot in the sky, they, right? But they they move north and south. They kind of nod up and down. Uh, yeah. If if they're geostationary, they're going to be right up over zero zero declination, zero latitude. So they're going to stay in fix. But if they're geo uh, synchronous, they could nod if they've got an inclination to their orbit. There, you'll see them in the field, kind of move north to south, but they stay over one latitude, one oh, longitude. Oh, okay. Yeah. But and they then, must be like really far away for for you to get them. Yeah, you that bright. I mean, yeah, they're 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 out there twenty two thousand three hundred miles or so. So you won't see them with the naked eye, but you can see them with the telescope. They're going to drift. Uh... East west as well as the Earth turns, right? Because it stays over a certain point of Earth, so they drift relative to the stars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you're imaging that one location, you'll see them kind of just move up and down. Neat. But they're not going to move as fast as the uh, as the the low Earth orbiting ones do, where they just right, zip no, right through correct. your field of view. Yeah. No, no. All right, I'll move it to Gary's view. This is M33. Nice. Again, one Yay. minute per, and the yeah. uh, the nebulosity regions really came out nice. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's yeah, Triangulum, finally. right? M33 is the Triangulum galaxy. So there's sort of three galaxies, three big galaxies in the local group. There's Triangulum, Andromeda, and the Milky Way. And then there's like 36 total members in the local group. Uh, mostly they're all just dwarf galaxies and you know the Magellanic clouds and things like that. But uh, but this is one of the big ones. Is this guy? Terrific. Yeah, some of the uh, H2 regions there have NGC numbers. <laughs> they're so bright. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So they have their own visible uh, nebula. Great. Yeah, it's amazing when right up here in the top right. Yeah, yeah. Well, like we think about the Tarantula Nebula, right, which is in the Magellanic Cloud. It's not in the Milky Way at all, and it just looks its so ferocious looking. Oh, man. Okay, I'm going to check out how David's art project is going. Yeah, finally, it's finally starting to look like the moon now. You can just nice. see the, uh, yeah. the, the uh, edges of the trees. It's just clearing the tops of those trees. So that's the Earth's rotation, actually, where the, the moon is uh, rising over those trees. So... It's way to get this now. So. Well, I was, yeah. was going to say you're quick with a chainsaw there. <laughs> oh. Nope, it's just clearing yeah, the edge of the trees. Yeah, you switch between uh, Andrew's view, and then you can see that, yes, indeed, you're getting the same thing from different sides of the planet. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and through my cast of grain, it's flipped. But. Yeah. Uh, Eric... Uh, Eric Charlin says, feel free to go longer tonight. I was late. So, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. We'll, uh, we'll keep rolling. Um, what else we got here? Any other questions? And again, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, requests, just let us know, and we will do what we can to find what you need. Um, Plus nine on... Uh, Willie Romer's uh, observations of Jupiter's moons there at the top. Let's see. Calculating uh, the speed of light with Jupiter's moons. Yeah, so this oh, is a yes. question. Yeah, this is a question that uh, Sterling Gothrop asked early on. I heard they use they observe the motion of Jupiter's moons to calculate the speed of light for the first time. Is that true? And how do they do it? Are you uh, familiar with that, Mike? Yeah, Oli Romer did this in. Uh, it was probably the first thing I know of where anybody actually showed that the speed of light is finite. Um, you know, they were puzzled by the fact that the the phenomena that you're seeing here on the virtual star party with the transits of the planet, uh, moons of Jupiter and the shadow transits and eclipses and so on, they would be off uh, by something like up to an hour. And it turned out that they finally realized it depended on the distance to Jupiter at that time. So when it's farther away, 
their predictions were late because it took longer for the light to get here, and when Jupiter was closer, it took less time. And and he checked it out and found that that fit and got a, it. was a really rough estimate of the speed of light, but considering that the estimate before that was instantaneous, it was pretty good. That was, what I think it was 18th century. That's amazing. I, I, I always like uh, Douglas Adams' line that light travels so fast it takes most civilizations millions of years to discover it travels at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Katrina yeah. Ink... Inky asks, any comet visible tonight? Is Lovejoy still around? So, David, where are we at the comet? Uh, uh, mo I, I think Lovejoy is down around 8th magnitude in the morning right now. I know there's another comet, Brewington, that's in the 10th magnitude. Uh, we, we don't have... Uh, there's a few binocular comets on tap. Uh, the big interesting thing is going to be Comet A1 siding spring when it heads toward Mars and makes a very close pass in October. It's going to be about. It's going to be a binocular comet around that time, about seventh magnitude, I think. We we don't have any really bright comets on tap, but you never know. That could change. Um. Let's see. Alison Bondi asks, "What's the most difficult object you've ever imaged? How did you accomplish this? Also, were you talking about imaging a supernova? That would be swell." <laughs> uh, let's. I, I'm going to say I'm going to speak for the Virtual Star Party here that the the toughest thing that we had in the Virtual Star Party, I'm going to guess, was Pluto. So hmm. we actually had Mike uh, Phillips imaging Pluto live, and uh, and that was quite an accomplishment, I got to say. And then I'm also going to say what Shaw did. Last week, bringing Mercury right into the star party during the daytime, good. I thought was a was really a tremendous accomplishment. So, yeah, it was just a, just amazing. Um, guys, what do you think? What's what's some tough things that you did? I did uh, G one in the Andromeda Galaxy, which is a globular cluster over in the Andromeda Galaxy, and with a eleven inch scope, that was more of a challenge of trying to. Find, figure out the star patterns than the actual uh, object itself, and uh, that that took me probably about two hours to get everything together, and before I even got to the image on it, that was fun. It is, I've uh, looked at the um, with with a big scope. Uh, looked at those uh, several times, and you know the globulars are star-like, so you. Finding them is the big oh, challenge. God, yeah. Seeing them, they're they're bright, but finding them is tough. yeah. That's a good that's a good challenge. My biggest challenge is doing anything because I have an old azimuth mount. <laughs> <laughs> I can identify with that. I, I've managed to image and get detail in the ISS with this rig, and that's that's kind of tricky to do because you basically got to have the camera all. The exposure and everything just kind of guesstimated before it passes over. That's on my bucket list. Yeah. I want to get the live view of the space station into the star party. That's still we still haven't that accomplished would be that yet. So awesome! I know. Won't that be amazing? <laughs> We've uh, there's one guy who's joined us and uh, and he has done it. He can get it. He can set it up and he can get mm -hmm. it happening live. Um, so you need a really good tracking rig. That, that, yeah. could, uh, that could track it as it moves, yeah. like almost I, on a joystick kind of track. I think he so. man he tracks it on computer. So what he does is he hooks it up and he uses like uh, Stellarium to track it while it's happening. Wow. So he, yeah. he tracks it w on his computer and the and the telescope follows the movements defined on on computer. But yeah, that's on my that's on my bucket list. Well, you know what? We are reaching the end of this hour, and uh, and I know some people want us to run a little long because they, they got here late, but I also know there's some astronomers out uh, in the cold right now, mm -hmm. so uh, so we should probably start to wrap things up. Actually, I don't think anybody's in the cold. Wait a second here. Shaw's in My Malaysia. propane heater just ran John, out. John's out <laughs> in the cold, I think. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm, I'm, I'm imaging from the comforts of inside the house. Oh, okay. And so it's Gary, remote so control. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. I'm, All right. Well, then I'm maybe freezing. you're. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Andrew's freezing. All right. Well, yeah, we'll it's, it's pretty cold. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to. Uh, all right. Well, let's wrap this up then. So, uh, wow. Uh, well, this is great. So, so Andrew, uh, again, as always, we appreciate your extra sacrifice getting up early in the morning and, and bringing us the view from the future. You're very welcome. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much. David. Thanks as always. I'm really glad your cool. your view got was so nice. I think that was some of your best Jupiter we've we've seen. So it was very cool. Yeah, it's almost straight overhead right now. So oh, it's great. Yeah, thanks Jupiter. Gary, bring in the color. 
Yep, got one more, the Bubble Nebula oh, nice. with M52 Ooh, in the upper yeah. right. Purdy. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. And James, thanks for destroying your webcam for us and bringing you on the DSLR. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Sith, my, my Sith Lord. <laughs> oh, there you go, John. You got it. You, you figured out how to turn yourself from a... Yeah, finally. A, I... a, a galaxy into a human being again. Yeah. Yeah. I don't say I know. You prefer the view of the galaxy. I know, but <laughs> you're going to have to deal with it. I like to balance. And Shaw, as, sorry about those clouds. Yeah. But, you know, that's your curse. Yeah. We'll find out who got the new telescope and we'll, uh, we'll chase it down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Tom, uh, yes, sir. Thanks, thanks. thank you very much for, for bringing the knowledge. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Thank you. No, no problem. So we've got an impromptu special guest this week, which was Mike Simmons, who joined us on the uh, on the weekly space hangout, and uh, and then I saw him commenting and uh, just had to bring me. In. So before we before we let everyone go, Mike, can you can you let us know briefly what Astronomers Without Borders is and how they what's coming up and how they can get involved? Well, Astronomers Without Borders. Oh, I can't just get the link to the hangout. Astronomerswithoutborders.org. Uh, yeah, that's right. Astronomerswithoutborders.org. Uh, we connect people around the world through astronomy. Uh, this is a good example of that. This is awesome because you've got guys all around the world. The ideas we're all doing the same thing, and here we are hanging out together, looking through everybody's telescopes. One big worldwide star party, but we have thousands of people who take part in a lot of our programs. Global Astronomy Month coming up in April. We have dozens of programs and a lot of things coming up on the website. So it's it's the same idea, pretty much as what you're doing here. It's not all interactive like this, but programs are observing programs, sharing resources with others, uh, stuff like that. So right. you can check it out, and anytime I get a chance to talk about it, I'll be evangelizing. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Well, and we're we're big supporters of, of what you're doing. So uh, you know, if there's any way we can help out, we're uh, we're I volunteer everybody here. That we're we're glad to help. Ah, great. Good. You're on the list. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, so, uh, hey, thanks, everybody, for uh, for watching. Thank you, all the astronomers, for, for supplying their telescope. As always, your, your sacrifice is greatly appreciated in the cause of science. We all really You're appreciate it. You're very welcome. It, so thank, so you. thank you, everyone, and we will see you all next week. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.